Thus far in our study of the book of Ezra, we've seen how a pagan king named Cyrus was used by God to allow the Jewish remnant in exile to go back home to Israel. He even paid for the trip and supplied the resources for the rebuilding of the temple. I mean, what could possibly go wrong? All is good, right? No way this can go south. Well, wait a minute, not so fast. Let's think for a minute about a historical window to illustrate this. Maybe it was a little like the earliest years in the 20th century. World War I was over. You remember the war to end all wars. All was good, right? Not necessarily. Within a number of years, we entered the Great Depression. Once that was over, happy days are here again, right? Oh, not necessarily because it would just be a matter of months before on July 30th, 1933, Adolf Hitler would become the Chancellor of Germany, and by July of that year, the Nazi party was the only party in Germany. Historical window. What about a media window? These shows are popular today, the ones of renovations on HDTV. The actors or refurbishers take on a renovation project, and then they run into a snag. Maybe it's water damage. Maybe the house is settling wrong. Maybe there's termites. About the time they think they've got it, they find a new problem. Sometimes new beginnings can take a hit. And that's kind of the theme of Ezra chapters four or three and four. That's what we find, at least at this point. All of their efforts to rebuild home meet with opposition in chapter four to those efforts to rebuild home. In fact, in a great many endeavors, we encounter several naysayers and wet blankets, and it's not any different when we come to Ezra chapters 3 and 4. So the first seven verses of chapter 3, I would label rebuilding the altar the center of worship. Even before they rebuild the walls of Jerusalem, like we read about Nehemiah, even before they lay the foundation of the temple at large, they rebuild something else. And it's the centerpiece of their worship. It's the altar of burnt offering. Oh, it's not necessarily the presence of God, as we see in the Ark of the Covenant in the Holy of Holies with the mercy seat on top of it. It's not the altar of incense where prayers ascend to God. But it is a very central piece to the worship of Israel and reconstituting their being at home. So in chapter 3, verse 1, we read, When the seventh month came, oh man, that's such an important month. We have the Feast of Trumpets. We have the Feast of Tabernacles. We have Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. This is a big month, a big festival month. So in the seventh month, the children of Israel were in their towns and the people gathered as one man. What a great statement of unity to Jerusalem. Then arose Jeshua, the son of Jehozadak, with his fellow priests, and Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, with his kinsmen, and they built the altar of the God of Israel. Now again, this is the altar identified in the next phrase, to offer burnt offerings. So this is the altar of burnt offerings, as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. And you can see this in two different places in Exodus. You can read about it in Leviticus chapter 1, and then verse 3. They set the altar in its place, for fear was on them because of the peoples of the land. Now, already here in chapter 3, even though we're not to chapter 4 yet, where we read about the opposition, you have what's called in Hebrew the Am Haaretz, the people of the land, the ragamuffins who gave no uh, significance to the law of God in this particular case. So there was some fear on the part of the people, but they knew even in the midst of the fear and the people of the land opposing them, they had to get the altar in place where they could offer burnt offerings uh, on it to the Lord, burnt offerings both morning and evening. Why? Had to do with the forgiveness of sins. How can you reconstitute a nation when there is moral impurity involved in the human heart? Verse 4, and they kept the feast of booths, as it is written, and offered the daily burnt offerings by number, according to the rule, each as each day required. And after that, the regular burnt offerings, and the offerings at the new moon, and at the appointed feast of the Lord, and the offerings of everyone who made a free will offering to the Lord. So they're observing their festival times, their new moons, their festivals. But the thing to notice here is that um, they, they kept this feast of booths but maybe not completely. Because when you get to the book of Nehemiah, you read that they had not kept the Feast of Tabernacles uh, for since the days of Joshua, the son of Nun. That's 1,400 years. So maybe what we're really reading here is they kept the Feast of Tabernacles to an extent, 
but maybe not all the way of living in pup tents for a week to remind them of their wilderness wanderings. Maybe it wasn't completely done. Verse 6 says, from the first day of the seventh month, they began to offer burnt offerings to the Lord, but the foundation of the temple of the Lord was not yet laid. So they gave money to the Masons and the carpenters and food and drink and oil to the Sidonians and the Tyrians to bring cedar trees from Lebanon to the sea to Joppa, according to the grant that they had from Cyrus, king of Persia. They're doing everything they can to rebuild home. And where that starts for them is the altar of burnt offering to deal with their sins. What I would have you notice as the first seven verses conclude is how God was already showing his wide embrace of other peoples. The Sidonians, that would be from Sidon. The Tyrians, that'd be from Tyre, okay? These are enemies of Israel. They're cities way up north of the land of Israel. And they always were in the, you know, nipping at the heels of Israel, if you will. And yet God was already showing his embrace. He wanted to float down some logs from the cedars of Lebanon. That's a phrase you read about in the Old Testament quite a bit. And they would land them at Joppa and then bring them up to the temple area. God was already showing his people that his plan on this earth to rebuild home for people was larger than just the nation of Israel. But we got to get the altar of burnt offering in place. That's the centerpiece of worship because it deals with forgiveness. Now, the next part of rebuilding is rebuilding the temple. Now, already we read that they hadn't laid the foundation of the temple, so rebuild the house of worship. That's in verses 8 through 13 of this chapter. We pick it up in verse 8. Now, the second year after their coming, so first it was just the seventh month. Now it's a couple years they've been there. A lot of time has elapsed. The, they came to the house of God at Jerusalem in the second month of that year. Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Jeshua, the son of Josadak, made a beginning together with the rest of their kinsmen, the priests and Levites, and all who had come to Jerusalem from their captivity. They appointed Levites. Well, that's important. If you're going to make sacrifices, you got to have priests and Levites from 20 years old and upward. So not just anybody could serve. This wasn't the teenage boppers. This was somebody else to supervise the work of the house of the Lord. And Jeshua with his sons and his brothers and Cadmiel and his sons and the sons of Judah. There we are again. Judah just keeps coming up in our text because we've got to get this in place so the Messiah can come. Together supervise the workmen in the house of God, along with the sons of Henadad and the Levites and their sons and their brothers. Now, we have a lot of people working on this project, and it's a good project. But look at what happens next. Verse 10. And when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, the priest and their vestments came forward with trumpets. Ah, we got the altar in place. Now we got the foundation of the temple in place. And it looks like worship just breaks out. You've got all kinds of doxology taking place here. And it says, they came forward with trumpets and the Levites and the sons of Asaph with symbols to praise the Lord. The word praise is halal, halal, the idea of giving praise to God. It's what's very crucial in the Psalms, according to the directions of David, king of Israel. And they sang responsively. Wouldn't you have loved to have been a fly on the wall and listen to that great antiphonal choir? Praising and giving thanks to God, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever towards Israel. One little comment, one of the most important Hebrew words is used in that little phrase, his steadfast love. Some versions translate it, his loyal love. It is the Hebrew word chesed, and it means his covenantal love, his, his, his loving kindness, and endures forever. This is actually a statement that's sung many times in Israel's history. It's in Psalm 136. It's in some of the historical books with David and Solomon. So as they're building, they're singing. It's kind of whistle while you work, if you will. They're singing the praises of God because they understand that what they're building is significant. It says, and all the people shouted, shouted with a great shout when they praised the Lord because of the foundation of the house of the Lord was laid. But many of the priests and Levites and the heads of the father's houses, old men who had seen the first house, wow, uh, they're still around. They saw Solomon's temple. That would mean they're over, you know, 70 years of age. 
Maybe they saw it as a young boy. I don't know. They wept. And the Greek, the Hebrew word here is baka, which means to wail and to lament. They wept with a loud voice when they saw the foundation of the house being laid, though many shouted aloud for joy. So you got these opposite emotions taking place. Um, the, the sound could be heard, the sound of the people's weeping, and the people shouted with a great shout, and the sound was heard from far away. So you have some different feelings going on. Some of the older guys say, it's not like it used to be. <laughs> a lot of older people say that from time to time. The younger people saying, this is awesome, and they're have been filled with great joy. What's interesting is that the sound could be heard far away. I don't think that we think very often about how silent the ancient world was. Unless it was a construction project or war or a festival, the ancient world was quite quiet. Uh, there were no jet airplanes going overhead. There was no steam shovels doing their work. There was no, just the ancient world was actually more quiet than you think. And so for them to hear the sound of the praises of God scattered throughout the land must have been an awesome kind of thing. They had to rebuild the house of worship. And part of it is Jerusalem sets on a hill. So it would act as a natural PA system, like a, yelling somebody's name up in the mountains. So the rebuilding of the altar, which is the center of their worship, the rebuilding of the temple, which is the house of worship. But now we hit chapter four. And that's where the naysayers, that's where the wet blankets, that's where the Eeyores, <laughs> that's where the Debbie Downers and the Drainers come. The adversaries feigned help. Look at chapter 4, verse 1. Now, when the adversaries, and the Hebrew word tsar means the ones that are opposed and on the other side, the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin, there it is again, heard that the returned exiles were building a temple to the Lord, the God of Israel. They approached Zerubbabel and the heads of the father's houses and said, let us build with you, for we worship your God as you do. Sounds good in content, but I rather think they're saying it with a snarky voice. I don't know. And we've been sacrificing to him ever since the days of Eshar Adon, king of Assyria, who brought us here. Now, these are foreigners that were brought in in 722 BC. And they say, oh, we're like you guys. We worship the same God. Sounds like syncretism to me. Sounds like they mixed up a little bit of Mosaic Levitical law with their own traditions. And that, how I know that is because of the next part. But Zerubbabel, Jeshua, and the rest of the heads of the fathers' houses in Israel said to them, you have nothing to do with us in building the house to our God, but we will alone build to the Lord, the God of Israel, as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, has commanded us. So these adversaries, we don't want anything to do with them. No way. We read in verse 4, Then the people of the land discouraged the people of Judah and made them afraid to build and bribed their counselors against them to frustrate their purpose all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even into the reign of Darius, king of Persia. Now we have some other historical stuff going on, but my point is the naysayers, the feigned help. These adversaries, these people of the land, the Amharats, they are feigning their help. They're pretending to want to help, but they really don't. In fact, when you look at the chapter, you will see these kinds of things. You will see them discouraging them by verbal dis discouragement, uh, trying to fear and intimidate them, trying to bribe them, writing letters against them. That will be the next part. Lying about them, feigning their loyalty, acting like they're really, you know, loyal, and actually doing some record checking to say, hey, these guys are not the real deal. They've been rebellious in the past, which leads us to this next part. It's not only feigned help, there's a feigned letter here that takes place. Now, this is most interesting in the book of Ezra, because one of the strangest things takes place next. First of all, the letter we're going to read about is not in Hebrew, it's in Aramaic, and it will be that way for a while. Secondly, this letter is actually a flash forward. <laughs> we talk about flashbacks in the realm of theater and movies and such like. This is a flash forward. Chronologically speaking, it's way out of place because it deals with events that are in the book of Esther, okay? Uh, but... Uh, 
what's happening and why Ezra puts it here when he writes his book, if he is the author of the book. And that is because uh, it fits chron it doesn't fit chronologically, but it fits thematically. The names of the people involved in this letter are dealing with the time of Esther. Ezra is topically supplying some of the information that does fit the context of the opposition, if you will, even though the rebuilding of the temple is sort of out of sync. So we'll read a little bit of this in beginning of verse 6. And in the reign of Ahasuerus, now Ahasuerus is Artaxerxes, which is the son of Xerxes. In the beginning of his reign, they wrote an accusation against the inhabitants of Judah and Jerusalem. So this is while some things are taking place back there. Here's the letter, verse 7. In the days of Artaxerxes, Bishlam and Midredeth and Tabil and the rest of their associates wrote to Artaxerxes, king of Persia. Okay, again, this is, this is the son of Xerxes, and this is Ahasuerus that the book of Esther talks about. The letter was written in Aramaic and translated. Rehum, the commander of Shimshai, or Shimshai, the scribe, wrote a letter against Jerusalem to Artaxerxes, king, uh, as follows. Rehum, the commander, and Shimshai, the scribe, and the rest of their associates, the judges, the governors, the officials, the Persians, the men of Erech, the Babylonians, the men of Susa, the Elamites, and the rest of the nations, whom the great and noble Asnapar deported and settled in the cities of Samaria, and in the rest of the province beyond the river. A lot of history, a lot of names going on there. This is a copy of the letter. To Artaxerxes the king, your servants, the men of the province beyond the river, send greetings. And now be it known to you, king, that the Jews who came up from you to us have gone to Jerusalem. They're rebuilding this rebellious and wicked city. Wow. There's nothing in there about rebuilding the altar and laying the foundation and Cyrus giving them the money and the ability to do so. Nope. They're, they're thinking way back to previous the captivity. They're furnishing the walls, repairing the foundations. Now be it known to the king that if this city is rebuilt and the walls finished, they will not pay tribute, custom, or toll. In other words, no taxes. And the royal revenue will be impaired. Now because we eat the salt of the palace, salt was a very staple thing in the ancient world, and it's a way of talking even about salary, but primarily it's a way of saying we, we uh, experience some benefits of this. And it is not fitting for us to witness the king's dishonor. Therefore, we send and inform the king in order that search may be made to the book of the records of your fathers. You will find the book of the records and learn that this city is a rebellious city, hurtful to kings and provinces. And the sedition was stirred up in the form of old. That's why this city was laid waste. We make known to the king that if this city is rebuilt and its walls finished, it will you will have no possession in the province beyond the river. So what's the letter? The letter is basically saying, these guys are bad news. You need to stop this building project, O great king. Well, actually then, we kind of hearken back to what happens. And the king does stop this rebuilding. Sometimes when we rebuild for the Lord, <laughs> it takes a hit. And here's the hit, verse 17. The king sent an answer to Rehum, the commander, Shimshai, Shimshai the scribe, and the rest of their associates who live in Samaria, and to the rest beyond the river and the greetings. The letter was sent to you has been plainly read before me. I made a decree and the search has been made. It's been found that the city from of old has risen against kings and the rebellion and sedition have been made in it. In other words, the king says, we searched the archives. We found out you guys are rebellious. And mighty kings have been over Jerusalem who ruled over the whole province beyond the river to whom tribute, custom, and toll was paid. Therefore, here's the decree. The decree that these men be made to cease and that this city be not rebuilt until a decree is made by me. And take care not to be slack in this matter. Why should damage grow to the hurt of the king? Then when a copy of King Artaxerxes' letter was read before Rehum and Shemshai, the scribe and their associates, they went to haste to the Jews at Jerusalem and by force and power made them cease. Then the work on the house of God that is in Jerusalem stopped, and it ceased until the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. I think if you know your history well, you will see what's out of sync here, chronologically. But it fit, fits thematically that the adversaries had temporary success. Yes, sometimes our efforts do take a hit. There's plenty of Eeyores and Debbie Downers, like I said earlier, out there. There's a lot of wet blankets and drainers out there. Be warned. But God's people have one thing going for them, and that's hope. Napoleon said that leaders are dealers in hope. And my teacher, Haddon Robinson, said that hope is the music of the future and faith is the courage to dance to it now. 
even though the rebuilding will take a hit, it will go forward.